When I was three weeks old, my biological mom uh, was killed in a car accident by a drunk driver in a drunk driving accident. And so I had seven other sisters and brothers. I was the eighth child. And so my biological father decided that I was too young for him to care for because he had seven other children as well. And so he decided to give me away and allow my maternal aunt and her husband to raise me. And so um, I believe that it was that first level of rejection of losing my mom as well as my father uh, giving me away that opened up the door for me to have feelings that I felt different and felt strange, uh, that I didn't feel like in uh, all of the other kids my age. And so I grew up in the house with my cousins, um, but they, we were raised as sisters and brothers. Uh, but when I was 13, I was molested. And so at the age of 13, I had to move out of the house with my uh, maternal aunt and uncle. And I had to move in with my other uncle, who was a pastor of a church. I believe that it was the molestation that altered the course of my life. Although I had been uh, rejected, what I presume to be uh, rejected by my dad, um, and I did grow up for those 12 years feeling awkward and, you know, where's my father, where's my sisters, where's my brothers, and I did. I was internali internalizing some level of hurt and pain from that. It was the molestation uh, that altered the course of my life. It basically killed who I really was. Uh, I was very academic. I was very involved in school plays. I was very involved in church uh, plays and skits and dramas. Um, I was um, always on the honor roll. And at the very moment that I was molested, I was in seventh grade when I was molested, had never had anything lower than a, a B in school. And the very next year for eighth grade, I was an F student. And so that was the beginning of the cycle that showed how devastated I had become uh, as a result of this molestation. And then ultimately being put out of the house where I only knew them as my mother and father. And so at the age of 13, Although I lived with my uncle and his wife, it was basically that I became an adult at that particular time. It was the, I'm no good anymore, no one cares about me, no one loves me. Uh, what did I do to put myself in this position? Uh, man, what if I would have went through to the full course because it was the fondling. And so we didn't have the actual intercourse. And so I began to say, well, maybe had I did the entire intercourse, uh, maybe my life would be different. At the same time, I got involved in alcohol, I got involved in drugs, and uh, I was had, uh, and it was at that particular time too that I got introduced to lesbianism uh, because the woman who, it was actually a woman in our church um, who introduced me to lesbianism, uh, she was able to see the hurt and the pain and she began to pray on that and begin to uh, pray as in being a predator. <laughs> and she began to, to pray on that and she began to see that I was hurt, I was rejected, I was isolated, I was alone. And so she came in and she began to encourage me. She was supposed to be a mentor, but it was her that I actually got involved uh, in my first lesbian affair with as a teenager. So I was molested and when I was molested um, by my uncle, uh, my uncle who raised me. And so, and he was a deacon in the church that we attended uh, my aunt, who was technically my mom, uh, she was a Sunday school teacher in the church. So I was raised in the Christian church. And so I was very familiar with Bible passages. I was very familiar with God. And I had some sense of God even as, at a young age. But when I was molested, it seemed to me that maybe the Lord did not love me. Maybe this God that I had heard about uh, who was a protector, who loved the children, who cared for the widows. Maybe this was not available to me and it altered my thinking when I was already feeling different because I was not growing up with my biological family. And so as a result of the molestation uh, and as a result of me being in church and having one ideal of God and then experiencing this trauma, it altered the course of what I really, really thought about God, what I really thought about his people, because how could the church not protect me? How could God not protect me? And it brewed rebellion in my heart and it gave me a disdain uh, in my mouth for the things of God. And I felt like everything and everybody about God was a hypocrite. And as soon as I was able, I left the church. The fundamental problem in the church was they were people who 
uh, basically came to church to come to church, you know, minus the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, minus allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to be active in their lives, to conform them into the image of Jesus Christ. It was merely people gathering together, coming to church, singing songs, and then at the end of every service, they go back into living their own lifestyles. I feel now that the devil um, did all he could <laughs> to destroy uh, my purpose and destiny in God. That He started at a very early age. Um, at the time that my mom was killed and from the time that my biological father decided that he was going to keep the other seven and give me away, um, that that left me saying, well, why I'm not with my sisters and brothers? That was uh, a painful thing to grow up in the house with everyone who has the same last name and your last name is different. Uh, everyone who looks alike and you look different from all of them. When your father only lives uh, five miles up the road, but you never see him and you never talk to him. So that was um, a, a very traumatic experience as well as the molestation. The molestation was the thing that really turned the course in the direction that my life was headed. By then, the, the drugs and the alcohol, the alcohol in particular, it was my way of escape. It was my way of what I considered to have happiness, uh, to have joy. I turned into a different person when I was under the uh, influence of alcohol, uh, where I was very quiet and introverted. Now I can be happy and joyous in the life of the party, uh, where I was very fearful and very intimidated. I became very dominant and I became very intimidating. And so it, alcohol gave me the courage to be what I thought I wanted to be uh, without the alcohol. When I was 13 years old, and then I was molested, um, and then I just hit the streets. I had an uncle who was a pastor of a church, and so he already had his children. They made it very clear that I was there in their house until I was 18 years old, and at that time I would be leaving. And so I became an adult. And so at 13 years old, uh, I just began to live any way that I wanted to live. I realized something at the point of being molested and at the point of being involved. Uh, with the first and my first lesbian experience, I realized that sex was, was a tool that I could use uh, to my advantage. And so when I became about 14 or 15 years old, I became very promiscuous uh, with both men and women. And you throw in the alcohol with the drugs. Uh, there was actually a young man uh, who was another member of our church who was 26 years older than me. It was very widely known or uh, well, rumored that him and I was having uh, an affair together. And so he was a friend of my uncle's and he actually lived in our basement. He was a church musician. And so he was 20, 26 years my senior at the age of 15 uh, that I was with him. So I didn't have a lot of experience uh, with any loving type of protective environment. Uh, most of the relationships that I was involved in came by perversion by way of people who were in the church. Um, and so as a result of that, by the time I was 15, 16 years old, I was heavily involved in alcohol and, and drugs and with the party in life and having sex and sex for money and, you know, sex for favors and things of that nature. And when I became uh, 18 years old, I got involved with a young lady. Uh, this young lady had been married and she had two small children. And so she and I uh, decided that we were going to be together. And so it was that young lady that I ultimately ended up being in a relationship with for nearly 15 years. She was a little older than me. And so she had been married already. So she had uh, stability in her life. She understood being stable. There was times that I slept in cars. There was times that I slept in gangways and alleys. And so she represented that nurturing uh, side that I had always missed from not having a mom. And so she took care of me. Uh, she protected me. She loved me unconditionally. I seen her make huge sacrifices in her own life and even in the life of her children to make sure that I was cared for, to make sure I was provided for. And that was something that I had never experienced throughout my entire life. She encouraged me because I dropped out of school. She encouraged me to go and to get my GED. She would encourage me and say, Linda, you're better than this. She encouraged me to get off drugs. She encouraged me to stop drinking. And so she showed me a love and a commitment to me 
you know, that regardless of how bad it appeared that I was, that I was still good enough for her. It's definitely a lot of emotional enmeshments into lesbian relationships because it's not as much about the sex as people would be want to believe that it is. It's more about that emotional attachment uh, that uh, lesbians get from one another. In the areas that, that she was uh, weaker in, those was the areas that I was stronger in. And we were able to form a bond that was so tight that the police couldn't even break it. I remember a time when the police came to my apartment and they was asking her, because they were looking for me, and they were asking her, and I was right in the bathroom to turn me in. You know, where is she? We know that she's here. And so she was saying, I don't know where she is. And the police told her, you know what? I know that you all are lesbians, and the hardest thing it is for us to do is to break lesbians and make them turn on each other because of that bond that lesbians do have, that they protect. It's like it's you against the world. And so that was the way we viewed our relationship was that it was me and her against the entire world. And so, and it felt like that and we held to that. I can see how that when, um, when lesbians have, have sex, that how that they can uh, become into that one union that the Apostle Paul was talking about. Because I know that there's um, studies that's been shown that says that these chemicals are released during sexual intercourse that begin to bind you together. But also, as we, the body of Christ, believe in demons, we also understand of ungodly soul ties. And I believe that ungodly soul ties are actually uh, formed at the, at the time of sex and fellowship and communion and dinners and all of these things that begin to knit and connect our hearts together. And I do believe that there's this, um, this, this one flesh. There was times that um, she, she would be thinking something and I would say it. Or there's times that she would start saying things and I could finish it because we had become so closely knit together. It wasn't of God, it was from the pits of hell, but it was still something that was actually a reality that I witnessed through our relationship, that we had became uh, basically one, knitted together by the devil though. The young lady who I was with, she had started going to church, attending this church about a month before me. And so she attended with her friend. And so she had been asking me to come and because I had such a disdain for church, um, I refused to go. I felt like everyone was hypocrites, you know, based on my own experiences. Um, I felt like everyone was hypocrites. Um, no one was doing what the Bible was actually saying. And here I was, a homosexual and an alcoholic, a drug addict, a liar, a thief. But I felt like I was better than most people who attended church. And so I didn't want to go. And so uh, because I was still partying, because I was still drinking, uh, that was like the kryptonite in our relationship uh, that I had these addictions. And so she was becoming intolerant uh, to my alcohol and substance abuse addiction. And so she told me that she was tired. And so I went out one night, I stayed out till like five in the morning on a Saturday night when I promised her that I would be home early. I didn't make it in early. And when I did come in at 5 a.m., um, she just basically in, implied that she was done and she was leaving me. I went in the room, I sat on the bed, and I determined that this would be the day that I would go to church with her, <laughs> you know, as a, as a way or as a means to hold on to her. And so I went to church that Sunday and the worship uh, was going on and it was something that I had never experienced in all of my days of attending church. And the people had their hands lifted and you can feel the, the authentic presence of God in the room. And I just began to weep and cry and talk to the Lord and say, you know, this is what I've been searching for, but how can I get it? Because I was one who felt as if I was born a homosexual. And I knew that my homosexual lifestyle, that that was the divider between me ever coming to Jesus because there was no way I can change. Since I was born a homosexual, I knew that I had to be a homosexual. That was a life sentence for me, that there was no way that I can change. I wasn't one who chose to be a homosexual. I wasn't just doing some sexual activity. This is who I really was because I felt different my entire life. And so that was my stance. And that particular day as I was standing in the balcony and, and I was worshiping God, you know, with alcohol still in my system because I had just came in and drugs still in my system. And I was standing in the balcony and I'm dialoguing with Jesus. And he said something to me that changed me absolutely forever. He said, Linda, you could be born again. It doesn't matter how you think you were born. 
you know, you can be born again through me. And it was at that moment that I said, okay, Jesus, I'm going to give you a try. And since that day, it has been a process. It has been a work. It wasn't like everything changed overnight. There was conscious decisions that I had to make. But with every challenge the Lord gave me, He gave me the power to come through it. We did have some slips and falls uh, along the way, especially during those early months that we tried because we lived together. And so we did try to just separate our bedrooms. That didn't work. The Lord had me to actually move all the way out of the house because just changing rooms and living in the same house didn't work for us. I thought that me not being involved and, and being a homosexual anymore and being delivered from homosexuality, I thought that that would be the period. <laughs> and I soon discovered that that was not the period. Uh, what he began to do is say, well, okay, Linda, now let me do an inner healing on you. Now let's go all the way back. And he began to take me all the way back through my childhood and say those feelings that I said that I had that I always felt different. He said, now let's put the proper definition upon that, where you interpreted that as you felt different, so you're homosexual. Let me tell you why you felt different. You felt different because you wasn't raised with your mom. You're supposed to feel different. You felt different because your biological father gave you away, and that's a very painful thing, and that's a very hurtful thing. And so those was very natural feelings, but you still can't equate that to you were a homosexual, and those your feelings indifferent uh, determined that you were a homosexual. So he began to put things in their proper perspective and allowed me and taught me how to mourn those situations, but then also how to bury them and say, okay, that was then, this is now. And so through the power of the Holy Spirit, this is the new life that I have. These are the new opportunities that I have. And so with his help, that I can live the way that I have always imagined that I wanted to live, but I just thought it was unattainable to me. Maybe three years, two or three years after I got saved, that my father was stricken with lung cancer, terminal lung cancer, and he was given like eight weeks to live. And so I had approximately six weeks um, to repair things uh, with him. And so I was just a babe in Christ, you know, and we had to go through this whole process of forgiveness. And this is where he told me that he did love me. He just didn't know how to be a dad to me. And I told him that I forgave him. And, I actually was at his bedside when, when he passed and made his transition um, and I bought him medicine and things like that. And the devil would beat my mind up and say, he never bought you an Easter dress. He never bought you a birthday present and you're spending all your money on his medical care. You know, there was times that, that at his funeral I had to pitch in and because he didn't have enough money for his funeral that we pitched in and, um, and we were able to uh, to make sure that he was laid to rest properly. And so because of those things, I knew that God had done such an inner healing in me because he gave me the right perspective on exactly what, what it was at that time that was going on with me. The Lord has done so many things, other things uh, in my life regarding being rescued and delivered uh, from homosexuality. Uh, the most important thing he did is he gave me real peace and joy. You know, I had a form of peace and joy that was actually facilitated through the alcohol and the drugs. But now I have what we call the, the uh, authentic peace and joy that comes from the Lord. And then in my natural life, he has taken me, you know, across this nation uh, into other nations, sharing my testimony of deliverance. I have counseled, spoke with, met with, hugged uh, so many people, uh, homosexuals who, who want to exit homosexuality, um, as well as I got my GED, and then through the power of the Holy Spirit, I got my associates, and then through the power of the Holy Spirit, I got my bachelor's, and now I'm on the dean's list as a master's student. Things that could never be accomplished prior to me connecting in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> I would like to say to you, if you're struggling with, with homosexuality, you're struggling with uh, same-sex attractions, however way you choose to define it. I want you to know that only 11 years ago that I was sitting in your same position where I knew, no one could tell me, I knew that I was born a homosexual. I was convinced that there was no way for me to change. But I want to let you know 
that I really encountered the Lord Jesus Christ. I am not one who just simply stopped having sex, but internally I'm tormented. That is not what I'm saying today. What I am saying is through fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, He delivered me from homosexuality and He took the internal desires and attractions away. I no longer struggle with homosexuality. I no longer struggle with same-sex desires and same-sex lusts and attractions, um, no pornography, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that the Lord has brought me into the life that I always wanted to have. It wasn't because society told me that I was wrong. It was because my inner man told me day in and day out that this was something wrong that my own self was not in agreement with. And so as you may be experiencing some of those same thoughts that I have had, I want you to know that Jesus Christ is here for you today. It doesn't matter if you believe that you were born one way or not. Through the power of Jesus Christ, you can be born again. All those old things can pass away and you can become a new creature in Christ if you are willing to put your faith and trust in Him. Let me pray. Father, we come to you today, Lord. We're declaring that you are our God and you are our Lord. And Father, I pray now for all of my sisters and brothers out there, Lord, who are struggling with homosexual desires, same-sex attractions. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will begin to draw them because you said that men come to you because you draw them. And Father, I pray that they will experience your goodness because you said that it is the goodness of you that leads men to repentance. And Father, I pray that you would draw them by, by your power. You will begin to pull on their heartstrings and give them hope and faith that in you, that they can accomplish those things that they desire. And Father, that they will be able to enjoy the perfect peace and the perfect joy, which only comes from you. And Father, I pray that you would keep them and Father, I bind spirits of suicide and anger and torment and perversion and lust. God, that wants to riddle their hearts and their minds and torment them. But Father, allow them to experience you in a fresh way, that they will be with you in heaven for all eternity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.